creating wealth is a function of doing things which are sustainable over a long period of time. Sustainable projects or green is just economically right thing to do. Why do you need dollar? If I have what you need and you have what I need and you supply me and I supply you the stuff we can dominate in any currency, you gotta wake up in the morning when you grow up, look in the face in the mirror and you gotta like it. If you're gonna have that kind of mentality where you want to do it, you want to do it good for yourself, you will do it right. So I was reading this book recently and in that book it was written that first 18 years of your life shape you more than what happens in your later part. So tell us about your early days, your childhood. How was it? How was growing up? What did you enjoy the most? I was born in Kashmir, North India. So I come from a very middle class family. I went to a Christian missionary school called Burnall School there. I spent up to grade 9 or 10 in the school. Hmm. And then we left Kashmir. We moved to Jammu. In the meantime, Kashmir just blew up hmm. because of all the terrorism and going back was not an option. From there onwards, started a phase of life which was like a lot of struggle, you know. Living conditions were not great, you know. We had to literally, five of us, six of us live in a one-bedroom government apartment. And then from there onwards, uh, Obviously, these kind of things affect you. You don't notice them at that point of time. But yeah. these events, they kind of leave a deep mark inside you and start shaping your like thought process. And you start thinking, who you, what do you want in life? So mm. those years of growing, I just wanted to be successful. Yeah. And for me, the definition of success back then was just purely, I just wanted to be financially well off. I was so not happy of being where we were as a family. I just wanted to make money. So I ended up going to Russia under the India-USSR exchange of students program because that was free. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they paid for your ticket, paid for your living, paid your time when you were living there. And I spent uh, six years of my life in Austin, Sovietian. Mm -hmm. While I was studying there, every time I used to come to India, there was always an opportunity for trade. Mm -hmm. So I'd go and buy leather jackets from Vasantiha, mm -hmm. uh, Yashwan Place. I would go there. I know after my holidays would finish, hmm. sell them, take hmm. money, wow. buy VCRs, bring it back to India hmm. on the next holiday, sell them. That's how I started making money. Yeah. So that's how I started kind of, you know, wheeling and dealing. Hmm. But at the same time, I was worried that by the time I'm done, what am I going to do with my life? Hmm. So I used to come to India for my summer trainings. I did one of my summer trainings in DCM, Toyota. They used to manufacture LCVs in Saranpur in Noida. Okay. Right. And that's when I got an opportunity to understand what am I going to do as an engineer. Because yeah. I was studying production engineering. By the time I was done, although the summer training was, was fascinating, it was a, it was a three-month program I did there. What the company was trying to do, they were trying to bring as many parts onshore for manufacturing as they could. And during my summer training there, they were doing a specific part, uh, which was being imported from Japan, but they wanted to manufacture it. I was called the arm steering knuckle. It just sits right there in the steering, it turns the hmm. steering. So I was involved in the project it was fascinating because that's when I started realizing that, you know, spending when you're in university you really don't realize what are you learning? What are you doing? How does this all add up? Yeah. You know, I go to these classes, what does it mean? But those three three months I got an insight that, you know, it seems that when you go to a class and or, or when you're in front of a lathe machine or, you know, mm. you start seeing that how you can apply it. To, and that was, that was the most fascinating part. But when I saw people working there, so there used to be this thing called a blue shirt and a white shirt culture. Mm -hmm. You know, blue shirt is when you, blue, blue, uh, blue corner, blue yeah, and then, you, and then you grow up and, and it, as, an, as a trainee, you start with a blue, blue shirt and then, yeah. Then you wear red with a white shirt slowly. <laughs> so, I was impatient. Hmm. It still probably comes out in mean time to time. And I just couldn't see myself spending so much time to traverse that path. And hmm. even after you traverse the path from a blue shirt, I was like, where is it going to take me? Hmm. How, where will I be financially? And it was, I was focused. I just wanted to hmm. make money. Hmm. And at the same time, I wasn't really fascinated with the job. Like, you know, it was so, so, so mundane, so 
day to day. So you got to get up in the morning, do the same thing again. And more right. So I started thinking what I'm going to do with my life. The next thing I wanted to um, do is to know what I want to do. Mm. And when Soviet Union broke down and I was there, there was this huge chaos which was caused. I got an opportunity to do a part-time job for a Singapore-based company called RG Account Trade. Mm. When I did the job for them part-time, that's when I realized how the business world works. And that, you know, that, that fascinated me. These guys used to um, do counter trade. So you would know it, but in India, the earlier infrastructure in this country, be it the first steel plant, be it the first dam, mm. be it the first, you know, weapons that we bought, we have supplied by Soviet Union. And we were a poor country. Mm. So we didn't have the hard currency to pay for it. Mm. So we used to pay for it in rupees mm. as a nation. Mm. These rupees used to accumulate with the National Bank of Russia. And the Russians would then have to buy stuff from India over a very prolonged period of time. Mm. But we never used to produce anything of that value so that we can export a lot of stuff to them. Mm. So the rupees used to be stuck in the National Bank. So when Soviet Union broke down, they decided to sell these rupees at a discount. Mm. So these businesses came up, they would go and buy these rupees at a discount, which means they would pay, for example, 10 cents or 20 cents or a dollar. Mm. Now they have rupees. They would, they would come to India, buy consumer products with these rupees, take them to Russia, sell it, and then the payment would either come in dollars, but dollars were again, you know, hard currency was again stress for them back then, or you would take and turn something that you can export. Okay. So, uh-huh. it could be metals, it could be cow hides. You can barter. Barter system. So, that's why it's called counter trade. Mm. So, that's how it, so that's why I got my first brush with the world of business. That's a very interesting point because I think I was reading an article uh, because of the boycott of Russia from SWIFT banking system. Uh, India is directly trading, uh, giving, paying for the oil in rupees. And they have the same problem now. Uh, Russia has a lot of uh, rupees accumulated with them and they don't know what to do with these rupees. It's true. Yeah. So, so if you, it's just not the SWIFT. SWIFT is obviously it's a payment system. What are you talking specifically about the currency, right? How do we settle the trade? Yeah. The problem we have as a nation is that we don't have as exports to offer anything to them yeah. which would see when do you when do you need a third third party currency when do you need why do you need dollar if i have what you need and you have what i need yeah. and you supply me and i just supply you the stuff we can dominate in any currency yeah. we don't need to go through the dollar yeah and dollar is a currency to the world right now because the world 70 80 percent of the world trade happens in dollar yeah. right so yes the problem we have right now is that while we have an opportunity but we don't have enough exports from mm-hmm. here, which is not the case with China. Mm-hmm. China being one of the largest export mm-hmm. exporting countries, for the Russians to take payment in, uh, in, in in rubles is pretty easy because you know what? They go, they buy cars, yeah. electric cars, they buy uh, you know chips, they buy whatever they need out because China is the factory to the world. Mm-hmm. So if China is able to export to the West, which is to the Europeans mm-hmm. and to the Americans, you know, stuff, as long as that stuff doesn't have American technology or European technology, they can sell that to the to, to the Russians. Yeah. So they're settling the trade in their own currency, so they don't need dollar. Mm. And do you remember your first counter trade? Yeah. Or what was it? Whoa. And how did you st- uh, how did you decide ki I want to do this? You saw the opportunity. First of all, it was an ecosystem which existed there, so I was part of the ecosystem. So we used to sell a lot of tea, and we used to sell a lot of you know. Uh, sweaters and shoes and everything else. So I went to this uh, uh, collective farm down mm. south, mm. and they 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 wanted to buy, you know, take uh, take uh, the stuff. And we said, "What do you have? This we have wool." Mm. So we nominated a price for our product, and nominated a price for wool, and all was done in their currency, which was rubles back then. Mm. And we got so many you know, tons of wool worth so much in rubles. Mm. But what we would do is that we would know the conversion of ruble to dollar. So then we would take this wool, either export it to India, mm. because India would, would process it, or export to any other country that would pay in dollars. Mm. Basically, you were trading with the arbitrage. <laughs> yeah, these are price arbitrage dollars. Yeah. You make a little bit of margin there, you make a little bit of margin there, you make sure that your currency risk is not that much, and that's what you do. So that's how I learned to trade. That's how I learned business. Mm. And then the company I used to work for, 
evolved, you know, the few of the partners, they got together and they started a green business, so which I got to, mm. uh, which I got deeply involved in. So that's my career got into, but I never went to a business school eventually. Tell us something about the Russian education uh, system. How the first 18 years happened in India and then was it a shock for you? Was there a culture shock? To an extent, yeah. But at that age, you know, you can take these shocks much better. Mm. And when, like I just said, 18 years, why is it important? Because it depends what you have to do for the first 18 years and that forms you as a personality. In my case, it was hard work. So what formed me was like hard work book became my DNA. Mm. So it made me as who I, who I am as a person today. So if you ask me what's my favorite thing to do, I love working. I love doing what I do. And, you know, I enjoy it. And at times I ask myself, if I cut down what if I cut down my work, what am I gonna do? You know, I'll be honest. I'm nothing to I just don't I I don't I I don't have many other yeah. you know Hobby. hobbies in life to say that this is what I'm gonna do. I hope with time I'm gonna evolve. Yeah. Uh, I'm desperately, you know, looking for it. Yeah. But I think but as you grow you evolve, so while you were walking you mentioned that uh, you had kids and how they have different problems than the problems that you face. Uh, how do you think uh, raising kids has changed you as a person? Oh, I, my kids have taught me the most. My kids have made me change the way I think. Mm. To a large extent, uh, change the way I relate to people. Um, I'm much more excited about, you know, younger generations. You know, I see in other young people, my kids. And during our times, like, you know, if you tell your parents I'm stressed, we didn't know there's a word like stress which existed, right? Mm. And maybe it did. Maybe I was stressed. I don't know. But you didn't have time for this. They have different problems in life. They're growing in a different society. They're growing in a world which is full of social media in the initial stages. It does affect you. Uh, their problems have been different than mine. Mine have been, you know, mm. survival, struggle. There doesn't, there, there mm. haven't been. At the same time, one of the m most important challenges as a parent uh, is that, you know, you just want them to grow with right values. And that mm. matters the most because eventually you got to wake up in the morning when you grow up, look at the face in the mirror and you got to like it. Mm. If you don't like it, it doesn't matter how successful and successful you are. You just got to be able to look at their face and say, yeah, that's fine. Mm. So what I've been telling them and I've already tell everybody is that, you know, are you happy with yourself? Mm. Ask yourself this question in a candid form. Be honest. If you're doing anything which you're not happy with, mm. you'll know it. Mm. And how I learned it was when I left, my dad told me one. When I was about to take off, he said, I have no advice for you just other than one. Don't kill, a, kill your inner voice. Do you have an inner mm -hmm. voice? Yeah. It tells you what to do. Yeah. And you don't want to kill it. Mm. Because then you don't like what you see in the mirror. You mentioned about the values that you try to inculcate in your kids. I just tell them you got to be a good human being. That's why I tell them. Mm. Guys, you know what? you got to like your face. Yeah. you just got to be modest. you got to keep it down. And, and you got to like what you do. The essence of life is that if we really do good things, we feel good about ourselves. Mm, true. So I tell them be selfish. Yeah. Feel good about yourself. And the only way to feel good about yourself is if you if you are if you do good things. Good, yeah. And that's actually the crux of Bhagavad Gita as well. So you know, True. it's yeah. all there. It's just an easier way to explain it, isn't it? Mm. Your first you were in counter trade. So how did the you know shift happen from you did your masters and then you started business and you never went to business school? How did you taught yourself the fundamentals of business and how did you? grew on that on those tales he asked me a question we were walking outside he said uh, um, you know how did you leave engineering and hmm. go in the field of business yeah. and I asked him I said what is uh, what is education he said learn to learn so education effectively helps you learn to learn all your life hmm. right learning is a discipline right in order to learn you need to dis discipline hmm. now when you go to university there's a curriculum put around you that disciplines you because you have these benchmarks to it. Mm -hmm. Effectively, if you are a learner on your own, in the present day world, you probably don't even need to go to the university mm -hmm. if you if you are able to teach yourself, right? Mm -hmm. If you have the conviction. So, most of us, when we go to university, you know, it, it's learn to learn. And when we know, once learn how to learn, then we can learn anything in life. Mm -hmm. This is digital, right? So, if you have a computer in front of you, you have access to the information, world of information, you can teach yourself anything you want to. Mm -hmm. If you have a desire to do it, right? What does university do? It helps us discipline ourselves in the early stages of life. Most of people are not dedicated enough to, to, to learn because we live in a moment, right? Mm. So university teaches you discipline. 
and once you learn discipline then you use it for learning and it teaches you how to teach yourself i may be wrong here uh, you see a pattern of uh, entrepreneurs or billionaires and you see a connection of these entrepreneurs with the government and how do you think like you mentioned about india's manufacturing problem how what role does the government play in inculcating an in ecosystem and environment so that businesses can thrive any business that you build or start works in a certain regulatory framework yeah. the regulatory framework first of all governs it's like you know it lays down the its rules set of rules how you're supposed to operate in this space that's the first thing obviously governments have the right to do that so they do it through regulators right mm. and then secondly is that if as a priority india as an energy situation which we need to resolve yeah how to incentivize that industry or how to in- incentivize private capital to grow in the industries which can come through policies right mm. now in certain places like now india is doing production link incentive incentive pli mm-hmm. what is that that's policy right mm. so governments through policies and through regulatory net you know uh framework create the groundwork for businesses within which they got to function mm. so you can't function without without them right there would be no rules you know when people tell you that there has to be open market and free market yes i do believe in free market yes but at the end of the day free market also needs to be regulated mm. because humans by nature you don't put regulation around them bad things happen yeah. which is the debate right now on ai right does mm. it need regulation i think it needs because they can be all kind of different actors right at the, at the end of the day the only way for a common man on the street to have any say in the policy is through elections right mm. and these people these representatives of people when they put in the government their job is to take care of the interest of 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 population at large mm. right so any industry which grows in an environment where the governments or the regulators are late they become menace to society over a longer period of time that's what many us you know in 1997 i think hmm. in us they passed a law uh, a regulation called i think it's called article 230 mm-hmm. wherein platforms like google like meta mm-hmm. don't bear the responsibility for the content okay. on the platform which is great because they say it's free speech right yeah where did it get us it got us to a stage where now the governments are getting threatened the democracy is getting threatened because of the misinformation that can be spread on these platforms right mm, yeah. what happened regulators were late and now they are at a stage where they don't know how to regulate it anymore yeah. that's what my view is do you believe so i i may be completely wrong but the first set of billionaires that came out of india they had close ties with government and on the state run industry when when there was a transition between the state run versus the liberalization and all those stuff because of having no ties with the government they it kind of held them exploit that opportunity and created so they were the market leaders but uh, do, do you think it helps being in ties with the government at the point of time it did, at some point of time every in the, every industry evolved like that mm. you look at america today go and read that history of jp morgan mm. who formed the fed with the private bankers who formed the fed mm. right Look at City of London. Why did City of London become the financial center? Because they've passed this great, amazing legislation saying the euro-dollar trade can be done, but it won't. It'll be considered offshore. How does it offshore if it's done on your territory? So, industry evolves. People exploit opportunities. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh no, that doesn't. That's not the case. It happens all the time. But the question is, as this evolution happens, as has happened in the West, you look at the names like BMW. BMW used to be a you know instrumentality of third reich yeah. there's this book which i read about dutch bank which says that they were even financing uh, the chemicals which were being manufactured for the gas chambers mm-hmm. were so links with government have been there it's just that as industry has grown and people have grown and you know we're becoming more civilized democracies have taken taken more and becoming more deep rooted the media has become more informative rules are evolving and changing at a different pace in different countries Mm. You mentioned about uh, freedom, democracy. Uh, there is a contrast. Like uh, there is uh, various authoritarian regimes, like China or maybe some other Middle Asian countries, uh, who say that uh, you have to follow these rules, and for this uh, drawback, we'll give you growth. We'll give you faster growth than a democracy would have given you. 
Uh, what's your view on that? My view is that um, the best way to govern us is democracy. Mm. It's chaotic. It's got its faults. You know, mm. um, it's the best way we found as humans. Mm. Um, it comes with this, with its this. But me, uh, as a person, I'm a democrat at heart. I'd like to speak my mind when I want to. Mm. Freedom of speech is very important for me. And I think in open societies is where you know people come up with all kind of amazing innovations and ideas. Mm. And democracy is generally good for us as humans. We went out through democracies, right? Mm. We go out, we protest, we feel good after that, right? Yeah. Now, somebody is listening to us. We feel important. We feel, you know, inclusive. We, feel we have a way to influence this process. Yeah. So I'm a Democrat at heart. I know democracy might not be the best way to have growth, but I'm a Democrat. Yeah. And you worked with the steel ty- ty- tycoon, Mr. Mithil. What were the things that you learned while closely working with him? Um, perseverance. Um, be bold. Have the vision. Don't be scared. Mm. To take a take a contrary view. Hmm. And be disciplined. Coming to the current stage of India, so the government has set some uh, limits that by 2030, 2050, they want certain percentage of the energy to come from the renewable sources. How are you being in the oil and tra- trading oil industry? How are you adapting yourself with this thing of... You know? so what we did is we decided to, at some point of time as a family office, mm. we decided to divest out of oil and gas. So by 2020, we divested everything. 2018, mm. actually, we started. So we have no one gas investments as of now. And we divested from oil and gas, not because we thought, you know, the world doesn't need oil and gas. Mm. The industry was changing. It was becoming much more political. Yeah. At the same time, it was becoming much more deep-pocketed. For a family office like us, the demand of equity was growing up mm. every time, right? So we found out that for us, as a, this is probably not the business that we want to be in. And we pivoted to renewable energy. Yeah. Uh, we have built, we built one platform in India which was under the brand in Orange, we sold it. Yeah. About one gig, we are building another two gig capacity right now. Because we are doing it because it's just, first of all, it's good, it's sustainable. And secondly, it just makes economic sense. Yeah. So a lot of sustainable projects or green is just economically the right thing to do. Yeah. It might be not on the shorter horizon, but on the longer term horizon, it's just the right thing to do. Yeah. So when we realized that, we really be with it. Then a certain you know, industries that you're bullish on. And and when you invest at a, you know, at a such a scale, what kind of returns do you look in before investing a particular uh, factory or a gig or a industry? At some point of time, you just want to build good, sustainable, long-term businesses. Huh. Mm. And return happens. If you build any good project, which you build because you want to build something that's sustainable and can solve a problem, mm. be it providing energy, we invested in Maharashtra and distributed solar, not many people did it. This like 10 megawatt solar plants mm. in about 15, 20 places which provides farmers solar power in the daytime. It's just the right thing to do, right? And if you build it, yeah. it's just going to make economic sense. Yeah. So I think returns is a function of not going with returns and then it's building sustainable businesses mm. and you'll see returns ha- happen. It just becomes sustainable. You just need to have a long-term horizon. You mentioned about liking non-fiction books and movies. Uh, what are your few favorites? Non-fiction? Yep. I read a lot of business books. Mm. You know, I um, uh, the last book I read was um, about this Dutch bank, this history of Dutch bank, which taught me how how these institutions that have become so important, how they evolve. Mm. So I like learning more about industries and people who have actually, you know, impacted the world one way or the other. Mm. are important to lives of people today. How do they become what they are? And that's where my learning comes from, you know, what should we be doing? It's a constant learning process. Mm. So you mentioned that you're starting because you were chasing money. But at this point of time, you know, the horizon has shifted. Mm. And there are a lot of young people in India who are chasing money. What would be the advice for you? Because you have seen both the worlds. So even if you want to chase money, chase it in a manner where it's sustainable for you over a longer period of time. Which means, and the way I classify it is two things. There is, you can be rich or you can be wealthy. And creating wealth is a function of doing things which are sustainable over a long period of time. And if you're going to have that kind of mentality where you want to do it, you want to do it good for yourself, you will do it right. Which means you'll do it right as the regulatory environment is concerned because if you do anything unregulatory, it will short term. You'll rather build an asset or rather build a business that's going to be good over a longer period of time. And what's good for you has to be good for the society only then it will be longer term. Yeah. You can't build a business today which is just good for you. Then it's not sustainable. 
So it doesn't matter where you start from. The key is that if you want to be selfish, be selfish the right way, which means do good for yourself. And if you do good for yourself, it has to be for the good of the larger society. Only then will it be sustainable. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, guys. Super exciting.